Good morning and welcome to another episode of Let the Bible Speak. My name is Alex Meredith. Uh, today we're going to be continuing this series, The Crown. Uh, I'm really glad you've joined us for this today. So far in this series, we've talked about the rise and the fall of King Saul, the first king of Israel. Uh, then we've talked some about David, soon to be the second king of Israel, um, and his early years and his rise in popularity. So during the early years of David reign, uh, David's reign, I should say, that's where we are. Um, and actually, I'd forgotten, we had already gone over the anointing uh, and the public anointing process. So by this point, David is already king. And we're really going to be looking today at, at a story in those years that demonstrates the value of kindness. Now, you may think uh, kindness is something that, well, we already know what that is, right? Well, it's something worth focusing on today, frankly, because I think there's a shortage of it. And, you know, I think about my own life and I think about the fact that I would not be where I am today without the people around me who have been kind to me. Uh, there is a guy, I remember this years ago. This is when I first learned to drive, actually. Uh, family didn't have a lot of means at the time. And I remember I had a few dollars in my wallet. And I was driving with my younger sister somewhere. We were driving back home, and the left turn signal in the front of the car was out. And so I thought, you know what, I've got a few bucks on me. I'll drop by the auto parts store. I'll get it, and, you know, my mother will be very grateful, right? So I go to the store, ask for the part for this particular car, and rang me up for something like $8, right? And I only had like three or four dollars, which I thought would be enough, and, and it wasn't. So, rang me up for that much, and I pulled out my wallet and realized I didn't have enough. And the cashier saw that I didn't have the cash to be able to pay for it. So what he did is he reached in his back pocket, pulled out his own wallet, and began pulling money out. Well, he only had a couple of bucks, so what he did was he ran out to his car, gathered some of the change that was there in his own car, brought it back in, and helped pay the difference on what I couldn't pay for the light bulbs. And, you know, it was only probably three or four dollars at the time, but that three or four dollars really stuck with me. Uh, the fact that he went out of his way to, to do that for me and my sister and my family, um, it, it was a small thing, but it was a big thing personally. I remember friends, uh, one of my best friends in high school, his parents actually, who, you know, they treated me like a son. And when I was planning to go to college, they said that they wanted to contribute to uh, the college tuition, which I was just shocked. <laughs> uh, and it's not because they had any obligation to or anything like that. They just wanted to. They wanted to help. Uh, back when we came up here for the first time, me and my family up to Marquette, uh, it was right at the start of the whole COVID pandemic. This was in March of 2020. And actually, the, the week that I was supposed to be here to interview, um, it got cut short because this was right when not only had the outbreak started, but this is when states started, started legislating things about travel and what stores can or can't be open. And we didn't know if we were going to be able to make it back. Uh, so right before we left, we were actually at another uh, home of one of the members of the church. And she and uh, another woman put together this basket full of supplies, full of food, 
paper towels, you know, all this stuff that they had no obligation to give, but they just gave it because they wanted to be kind and wanted to be helpful. And who knew when we were going to be able to make it back, if we could make it back at all. So, you know, these people that I remember, they were servants to me. And that's why they were so memorable. And I would bet that the most memorable people in your life, you know, you think about the people that you look up to most, right? If I were to venture a guess, I would guess that those people are probably most notable in your mind because they are servants. And maybe they were even servants to you, right? And that's quite different. And you might even say contrary to the picture of role models that the world typically tries to set up. We don't typically think about servants. We, people, we think about people with a lot of servants, people with a lot of power to command all these other people around them to do what they need. Um, it's just really remarkable how much of an impact kindness can have on someone's life. And when we're talking about leadership, especially, which is something we've been talking a lot about in this series, when we talk about leadership, uh, service, right, the, the act of placing somebody else's needs above your own, uh, and kindness, which is closely related to service, those things are critical for leadership. I remember I worked uh, at a fast food place a few years ago, and I had two different bosses over the span of my being there, and they both had pretty different ways of managing. Uh, one of them was very much the type of person to, uh, you know, it got busy and he would jump right into, into the kitchen line and he would start making plates, expediting food and trying to help us out and all of that. The other person, when it got real busy and crazy and we were having trouble keeping up, he stood back in the back of the room and said, hurry up. Come on, what are you doing? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Which one do you think was more effective? Which one do you think was more respected? The servant, right? So when we talk about kindness and the willingness to serve, it's a necessity for leaders who want to be effective. And it's a necessity for godly leaders who want to emulate the character of God himself, which by nature is uh, the character of a servant. We'll get more to that in a minute. The text we're going to be looking at today is in 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, I think this is one of the most wholesome passages in all of Scripture. It's not one that's talked about very often or that's very well known, uh, but I love it. Uh, at this point, just a little bit of background for you. David is king. Um, he has had a good bit of military success up to this point in his reign. Uh, he's very wealthy. He's got a big family. His kingdom is relatively at peace. He kind of had everything. He, he was a man who more or less had everything that he could have ever wanted. And what would you do if you were in a circumstance like that? Because that's kind of how we think about retirement, right? We think about our lives up to retirement is getting ready for a life where we have everything and we can finally sit back and relax and go, wow, I've got it made, you know? Which, which by the way, doesn't seem to happen for a lot of people anyway. Um, but maybe that's still the ideal, right? If we could have everything, we would love to be able to just sit back and relax. But here's what David does. So let's read 2 Samuel chapter 9 from verse 1. We'll read the whole chapter, but it's only 13 verses. And David said, Is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there is a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodibar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, 
I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame and both his feet. You have this whole passage starting out with David asking the critical question, is there anyone I can show kindness to? Uh, which, which is quite a remarkable question when you think about it, because it was totally unprompted, right? There's nothing that led David to ask this in the first place, um, uh, other than perhaps this feeling of owing something to Jonathan. Uh, he says, is there anyone I can show kindness to in the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake? Uh, you may recall that uh, David and Jonathan were very good friends, and Saul and Jonathan had since passed away. So he asks this question, looking for somebody to show kindness to, and then you have Ziba, one of Saul's servants, probably the chief servant of Saul's house. Um, he finds Mephibosheth, who is Jonathan's son, uh, and, and it mentions here that he's crippled, right? We'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, but he promises Mephibosheth a permanent home, uh, a place at the king's table. And then he gives Ziba and his whole family and his whole household a new home, a new role, a new purpose, uh, which, by the way, had probably all been lost when Saul d had died. So uh, probably the first thing to point out here is simply David's attitude in this whole uh, this whole event, right? Because he is actively seeking somebody to show kindness to when he had absolutely no obligation to do so. And you think about this friendship between David and Jonathan. Well, sure, they were friends, but, you know, Saul tried to kill him quite a lot, you might remember. And, and he's not necessarily looking uh, for anyone to do with Jonathan directly. He says, in the house of Saul. So, the fact that he had this desire to help out when he had no obligation to do so, he didn't owe them anything, but he wanted to do something. Uh, furthermore, there was no benefit for David in helping Mephibosheth. Um, you think about the benefit versus the sacrifice, right? Um, you know, I, I heard this last Sunday, somebody pointed out that we live in a very you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of society. And that's not at all what's happening here, right? David is not looking for any sort of recompense for trying to serve Mephibosheth. He just wants to do something good. And he's doing good to somebody who can give him nothing in return, right? Uh, which is really the nature of true service. There's actually a passage I want to read to you. This is in Luke chapter 14. This is a remark that Jesus makes uh, that really shows us what service is supposed to look like. So this is Luke 14, starting in verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be paid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Um, so David's actions here remind me of Jesus' approach to, uh, to service and his approach to leadership too, right? There's another passage over in John 13. 
it's a really good demonstration of this. Uh, we saw what Jesus said. Now watch what Jesus does. This is John 13, beginning in verse 3. Jesus, no, oh, excuse me. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, right? So you have the establishment of God's, uh, of Jesus' glory, and it reminds us just how great he was. And then in verse 4, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash a disciple's feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus led from a position of love and service, not from a position of force. Which I think might have something to say to our leadership structures today. You know, you think about what leadership should and shouldn't look like. And I see what Jesus does here, and I think, well, does that maybe inform us on what leadership should look like in the workplace, uh, in the home, in the church? Does Jesus have anything to teach us about those things? Well, certainly. Um, and what a better world. <laughs> what a better world it would be if people, and if leaders for that matter, woke up every single day looking for somebody to serve. I mean, can you imagine everybody in the world waking up with the same thought, who can I show kindness to today? Can you imagine what a drastically different world it would be? Wow. So now we need to talk about the crippled guy. I don't say that to be mean, by the way. I say that because the text points it out an unusual number of times. It's twice, but it's in some strange places, particularly the latter. So first of all, you might notice in, um, where is it, in verse 3. Is there not still someone in the house of Saul that I may show kindness the kindness of God to him, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. Why would you introduce somebody like that? That's the first thing that you say about them. You know, we do that sometimes, by the way, don't we? We totally do that. We'll say, this is Ryan. He's autistic, right? Or, or he has Down syndrome, or he's, he has a prosthetic arm, right? Especially for the more obvious things, we tend to point it out Perhaps because that maybe that changes the social contract a little bit. You know, may, maybe there's some sort of purpose to it. But it does seem a little strange, right? That the primary identification of a person would be with their disability. You know, I don't go around saying, Hi, I'm Alex. I have a blood clotting disorder. And I'm terrified of getting stuck at the top of a Ferris wheel. It's true, but it's not really helpful to you understanding who I really am, right? So... Uh, that's one instance. The second time we're informed about his disability is at the very end of this section, right? It, it seemed like they could have just stopped there. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate always at the king's table. They could have just stopped there. But no, it reminds you one, time, one more time, now he was lame in both his feet. Seems like a strange thing to do. The only thing I can figure is that it's important somehow to this passage. And I think there is a reason. And, he, and here's what it is, as far as I can tell. You know, when you think about physical handicaps in the ancient world, uh, especially in Israel, any sort of physical or mental handicap was, was typically associated with God's displeasure. It was assumed that if somebody had something wrong with them, it was a result of God's punishment for something that they did or for something that their family did right? This is evident in John chapter 9, verse 2, when uh, the disciples are walking with Jesus and they, they come across a man who was born blind from birth. And the disciples ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And of course, the answer is more complicated than that. It's not quite that simple. It's not necessarily true that that's the case, which is why in John 9, 3, Jesus says, it was neither for the sin of his, uh, his sin or for the sin of his parents that he was born blind. 
He was born that the works of God might be shown. The answer is not that simple, but that was the common thinking. And that being said, in addition to the fact that they simply did not have the medical resources we did today, typically people who were physically and mental, uh, mentally handicapped, especially from birth, they were either killed or they were social outcasts for the rest of their lives. Sounds harsh, uh, but that, that was the reality of that time, right? By the way, when you talk about Mephibosheth's disability, uh, <laughs> Back a few chapters earlier in 2 Samuel 4, we actually see how Mephibosheth is disabled. And what happens is he's with his wet nurse, it says, uh, at the time when Saul and Jonathan had died, which meant that uh, Mephibosheth was one of the potential heirs to the throne. And as soon as the wet nurse heard the news about Saul and Jonathan's death, she took off with Mephibosheth for fear that David would come and kill him to secure his claim to the throne. And in her hurry to flee the area, she tripped and fell, and the boy fell on the ground in, a, in an awkward way and broke his feet or legs or something happened where he couldn't walk anymore. So it was kind of David's fault almost. Um, that, that's in 2 Samuel 4, verse 4, if you want to look at that. All of that to say that when, when David summoned Mephibosheth, he would not have expected anything good to come out of that, anything positive to come out of that interaction. Uh, he was probably terrified. And by the way, did you notice what he said about himself? Mephibosheth called himself in verse 8 a dead dog. I don't get the impression he thinks he deserves very much. So imagine Mephibosheth's surprise when David shows him this extraordinary kindness and essentially adopts him into his home and says, you will always have a place at my table. It mentions that he treated him like a son. Verse 10, Mephibosheth shall always eat at my table. So he was expecting rejection, but then surprised by grace. Does that sound familiar at all? It should. I want to read you this passage from Luke chapter 15, a passage that some of you probably know quite well. This is a passage about a son who ran into some trouble, got himself into trouble, and was certainly expecting rejection. This is Luke 15, beginning in verse 11. And he said, There is a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that, property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring in his hand and shoes on his feet and put the fattened calf, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. He was expecting rejection, but then he was surprised by grace. That's really the story for all of us, isn't it? My father-in-law, great man. He, uh, uh, my wife was telling me about how when they were younger, uh, he has this odd habit, or at least I think it's odd, of, sta of standing in front of the television. Everybody else could be sitting down. He'll be standing there the whole time, hours at a time sometimes, uh, watching. And of course, these commercials started coming out a few years ago about how you deserve this. 
You should get this because you deserve it. You deserve this vacation. You deserve this. You deserve that. And he would utter the line, no, I don't. I deserve to die. Of course, what he meant was, in a biblical sense, he does. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Since he is among the sinners and sinners deserve death, well, he deserves nothing more than death. And you could say that as far as God is concerned, that is what we deserve. But good thing God treats us better than we deserve. There's a passage in Romans chapter 5 about that. Romans 5, verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We deserve nothing, but God gave us everything. Um, you think about the kindness that Jesus showed to us, to the people around him. And the funny thing is, when you really look at it, uh, his kindness had nothing to do with the worthiness of the recipient. You think about us. We didn't deserve Jesus' kindness, but he gave it anyway. What does that tell us about the kindness we ought to show to others? Perhaps it should not be based upon whether or not we think they deserve it. Maybe it should be based on who we represent, right? Matthew 5 talks about how uh, we, not, the status quo used to be that you would love your neighbor and hate your enemy, uh, but then Jesus transformed that. He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then he refers to the fact that we are sons of the Father. And because of who we represent, and because we have been loved by one who loved us, even when we did not deserve it, we ought to love those who don't deserve it. And we ought to show kindness in every place that we can. I want to read to you one final passage. This is from Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 9. This is right after Jesus was glorified in the transfiguration. Uh, he was glorified in front of three of his disciples, and then he followed it up with saying that he was going to suffer and die, which is showing that the greatest person who ever walked the earth is becoming a servant. And then this is what happened shortly after, Mark 9, 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked him, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. That's powerful. So you really think about the formula for kindness that Jesus sets. Whoever would be first must put himself last. And that's the challenge I want you to take with you this week. May God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Let's go.